there's nowhere else to start today, I think, but the market, given the moves that we're seeing in the market today. And given you've so recently said that inflation could remain entrenched, it's like the market as we sit here today is already starting to declare victory in the Fed's fight. Do you think this is too much of a knee-jerk reaction? Well, today is obviously quite a bit of enthusiasm over the inflation print this morning. And we are seeing, we are seeing core heading back down. We look at like roughly 4% year over year, which means that perhaps the worst of the storm has passed us. And that's, that's pretty much conventional wisdom was today was going to be a constructive print. I'm actually a bit surprised at how strong the market's reaction has been to today's number. This was not a, a, a huge upside surprise by any stretch of the imagination. It may also be a response to just how overextended the move in the 10 year was just a few weeks ago. I mean, it's hard to believe, but we broke the five year yield point for the first time in decades just a few weeks ago. And the market is at this moment in time enjoying a, a pretty substantial rally from the lows in bond prices, high in yields. And today might be just a continuation of that momentum. Now, do you think it's crazy then for people not to be buying at this point, given the move downward that we're seeing? Do you think that this move is sustained? Look, I, I think any any yield on the 10 year around this four and a half percent number plus or minus 50 basis points is a reasonable number to be at. I think it's it's hard to it's hard to argue that that we're way off the market, no pun intended, on the current 10 year yield. Now, what does this mean for the Fed? Do you think it would be a mistake for the Fed to take their foot off the pedal here, given what we're seeing in the inflation print and even cut into next year like the market is expecting? Well, so the, the question is, heading into next year, how fast do we cut? So if, if you look at where inflation is likely to print over the first half of next year, and unemployment's likely to head to somewhere in the low fours, you're going to have monetary policy that's too restrictive under those circumstances. Now, the, the key, from my perspective, is the, is the Fed needs to stay on message that they're going to put the inflation genie back in the bottle. And so if they, if they cut too soon, I think they risk losing credibility around their commitment to a 2% inflation target. So you know, the market's pretty optimistic that we're going to head into an easing cycle next year. And I think the Fed needs to balance that with making sure they're able to stay on message that they're committed to a 2% target. That all speaks to tighter financial conditions to the extent that there are more things that could break in this environment. What else breaks? What else breaks? Are you looking for the next Silicon Valley bank? I story? sure am. <laughs> so the, the risk in the banking system still lies in credit risk in middle tier banks. And in particular, their exposure to commercial office is, is a big risk factor, less so their, consumer, their exposure to mid-sized enterprises. I mean, to be clear, to be a, a mid-sized bank today is a really tough place to be. The market for deposits is becoming increasingly competitive. The cost of compliance has soared over the last decade. The amount of technology that the consumer expects you to bring to bear to solve their problems comes with a pretty hefty price tag. It's a really tough place to be today as a, as a community bank or as a, as a mid-tier bank. And now you've got not only those headwinds of costs and expectations around customer service and customer experience, but you've got a credit cycle unfolding. So I think that's where the risk lies today within the banking system, first and foremost, is, is in those mid-tier banks. Now, does the Fed get to where they need to go without causing a deeper recession? Now, you've said before, pretty recently, that you would expect a recession at some point. Uh, and so well, I will be right on that eventually. Eventually. <laughs> I mean, every economist is at some point right on that call. So instead of asking you when, I'm going to ask you what it looks like. So here's, here's our best guess. Our best guess was sometime late this year. Uh, it's November. So we're going to be wrong on that guess. Q2 right now is, is roughly the center point of our distribution as to when we're likely to see the United States in a recessionary environment. And I think, I think there's a couple of really important questions that will come into bear at that moment in time that should influence one's view as to how deep this recession is going to be. Number one is what's going to happen to fiscal policy in the United States. For choice, we think next year fiscal policy will not 
will not tighten that much. We're, we're heading into a presidential, presidential election. It's really hard for politicians on either side of the aisle to do what we need to do, which is to rein in our deficit spending in front of a presidential election. It's just, it's gonna be really hard politically to get there next year on that front. The second real question next year is how much will companies start to unwind the labor hoarding that we've seen over the last couple of years? It's been really hard to hire people. And as such, your large companies have been very reticent to let people go no matter what the circumstances are. So even if margins are contracting, even if you have gains from automation, people have been very reticent to let people go. Now we're starting to see for the first time the unwinding of that labor hoarding. What we don't know is how, how much of that labor hoarding has taken place. And then what worries me in a, in a hybrid work environment or work from home environment, the cultural or social contract that holds people together in a company is unquestionably weaker. I mean, we've all read about companies that have fired thousands of people on Zoom calls. There's no sense of, that's Jane who's worked down the hall with me for years, and I'm gonna go the extra distance to try to keep Jane employed here. It's like, here's the email to all, here's the video conference with a bunch of people, and goodbye. It's a very different moment in American employment history where I believe the bond between the company and the employee has become far weaker. And that worries me in terms of the willingness of corporate America to make cuts on their workforce that they just wouldn't have made at other similar points in the labor market cycle. You, is that you saying that the employment market will crack much um, more significantly than many are expecting? It could, is what I'm saying. It could. It's a wild card. So there's a lot to unpack here. We are going to go global, but we're going to start here at home because you've been pretty critical about the picture here for the fiscal situation in the United States. Um, I want to talk about the Treasury market because it's behaving a little bit like a meme stock. It's one of the most volatile markets here. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. I, I played meme stocks. <laughs> All right. So I, this I've is been not quite that, journey, that. This is nothing like that moment in time. <laughs> You know, but it is quite volatile, and I'm wondering to what extent it does concern you that treasuries are moving around so drastically. So, I mean, first of all, the treasury market is moving around drastically in comparison to 10 years ago, five years ago, when we had extremely low inflation. We were consistently below our 2% target and the government was involved in a variety of very aggressive policies to try to bring inflation back up towards 2%. It's, it's a very different world. We've come off the zero boundary in inflation. We've come off the zero boundary in rates. We're, we're in a market that for, for the trading of government bonds is a normal market condition. Like this is actually, this, I mean, it's a little more volatile than you might otherwise want it to be, but these are pretty normal, pretty typical conditions when you're in a full employment economy late in the business cycle. There's nothing about this that I would call in any way unusual or unexpected. I think what was more unusual was that all of us in this room went through such a long period of time with such aggressive government intervention in our markets, trying to encourage growth, trying to bring inflation levels up. So that was government intervention. What about the Treasury's management of how they handled the future fiscal load? You know, pretty recently, billionaire Stanley Druckenmiller had rebuked uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen for not doing more to finance the United States when rates were low. Uh, and she has since push, pushed back. But I'm wondering what you think about it. Well, with hindsight, we would have done really well with our trading. <laughs> Do you think they should have I mean, done anything? I, I, I mean, if I knew where rates were going to be today, could you imagine how much money we would have made if we'd taken a position on two years ago? So are and that's, you... that's a bit of the same call that you know is being levied against Janet Yellen. You can't cry over spilt milk. Of course, and I actually do believe he's right, we could have issued more debt at lower rates over the last several years. There's no doubt about it. And, and the, what's ironic is, DC is constantly concerned about the fragility of the private market sector. And one of the sources of fragility in the private market is the amount of short-term debt and the amount of short-term um, 
mindset that we have in, in how we allocate assets. So the amount of money that's on deposit with banks rather than being invested in seven-year or 10-year corporate loans. Everything that brings things shorter in term increases fragility. Bear Stearns went broke in a day because of the amount of funding they did overnight. All right, that's important to note. Ironically, the U.S. Treasury has been shortening its maturity as our debt's been going higher. So if, if you think about any playbook for how to prudently manage your balance sheet, let's, let's not play the role of rate speculator. Like Stan, like we're gonna push that aside, and, and he's amongst the best in the world at this. So it's, it's you know, like push aside the fact that the, the Fed did not play the role of rate speculator. But put on your, your hat of balance sheet manager. The more debt you need to manage, the more you want to extend your weighted average maturity. Like that's just basic finance 101. But as the Treasury tries to do this now, one of the big problems is you are seeing a fracturing of what it looks like to be issuing the longer dated securities. And with foreign buyers less willing to step in, what do you think this means for the ability of the United States to finance itself? Well, at some point, we need to actually take the message that's being delivered to us there and put our fiscal house into order. I mean, that's what the market's telling us. The market is telling us that we cannot run annual deficits of the magnitude that we're running, that we need to put our fiscal house into order. That's the message being delivered by the market. Us pivoting to issuing more and more short-term debt means that if there were a day of reckoning, the degrees of freedom that we have to navigate that crisis are far more limited. Now, there are a lot of people in the market who believe that with foreign buyers stepping back, that the marginal buyer is the levered hedge fund, people like Citadel, um, and the American public becoming increasingly active as buyers of treasuries. Would Citadel step in in a bigger way to buy more treasuries into next year? Well, let's just be very clear. The marginal buyer of treasuries is going to have to be American savers. No ifs, no ands, nor buts. And that's going to crowd out investment that American households would otherwise make in corporate bonds, equities, and other assets that contribute to the productive growth of our economy. Like that's where we're going to find the marginal buyer. And it's going to come at a cost in terms of our ability to create jobs and to enjoy a level of innovation and productivity that has defined so much of the life that we have lived in this country over the last century. Are there limitations, especially as bank balance sheets shrink into next year, for how much you can step in? For, so there's, a, there's quite a bit of chatter today about the bond basis trade. And I've, I've never seen so many people fixated on such a trivial problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually just bewildering to me. You're a, a significant asset manager. You have a, a portfolio that's tracking a, a, a fixed income benchmark, part government bonds, part corporate bonds, part mortgage-backed securities. And you want to optimize the return for your investors. I mean, that's what, that's what asset managers do. We're here to create alpha for our end investors. And so you look at the treasury part of your portfolio, and you go, you know what? I can sell my treasuries replace that duration risk with a treasury futures contract and invest the money in corporates and other interest-bearing assets and free up that cash to put it to a more productive use in the economy holistically. The hedge fund community buys those treasuries and sells the futures contracts to the real money community. It's just that simple. So the reason I'm asking this is because with this great attempt to clamp down on the basis trade by regulators, would that really constrain how much uh, hedge funds are stepping in to buy treasuries at, just as they're being issued? Well, I mean, here's, here's what's going to happen. The cost of doing that trade for the real money account will go up. So the return hurdle they need to earn to move from treasuries into corporates will go up which makes the cost of capital higher for corporate America, which reduces economic growth, all right? The trade will end there. The trade will end by, by real money managers committing less money to corporate America. That's what's gonna happen here. The hedge fund community, in some sense, 
just provides intermediation between access to the short-term funding market, which is extremely efficient, and access to the longer-term borrowing market, which is far more balance sheet constrained. That's what's, that's what's gonna happen here. And there's no doubt, like, the federal government can readily end this trade. And they may just choose to do so. And they'll do so at the expense of the American taxpayer to the tunes of, of tens of billions of dollars of interest costs. And they'll do this at the expense of American companies and raise the cost of capital for corporate America. I mean, they, they will probably do this. So we're going to get back to regulation and its other many forms. But let's spend a note to broaden out for a minute on what's happening in the world, um, particularly the outbreak of two major wars. As somebody who's leading Citadel, how do you prepare for events that can cause such drastic geopolitical consequences in the world? So geopolitics has been a big part of our business now for, for quite a bit of time. I mean, we, we have seen the end of the peace dividend. There's a war in Europe. I mean, did, did you ever think in your lifetime you'd say there'd be a war in Europe? I didn't. I mean, it's just... We lived through peacetime for so long. So the re resurgence of the lack of peacetime, what does that mean for investors? So first and foremost, it means that all of us are going to just, we're going to have higher anxiety in our day-to-day -day life. I mean, there's just, there's no doubt about it. And that, that changes people's perspectives towards how they deploy capital, right? When... When it's bright, sunny skies, it's, it's a lot easier to take on a variety of different risks, whether it's building a new factory, whether it's engaging in long-term investing. Like, it's just a very different world when the world is at peace in terms of how business leaders and investors think. Now, let's take a step back to the, to the nuts and bolts of what this higher level of geopolitical risk means. It means we spend a lot more time with people who are involved in geopolitical risk analysis. And there's a number of firms that are extremely good at providing this insight and analysis. It means that our portfolio managers are very focused on what they have to say. And it means we're trying to understand in the context of our portfolios, what exposures do we have to emerging geopolitical risk developments around the world? So when you saw the Russians amass their, their troops on the border with the Ukraine, you're thinking about if they come across, what are the odds that they're gonna cut off gas supplies to Europe? If they cut off gas supplies to Europe, what's that mean in terms of the European economic response to support their industrial base? What's it mean for the, the largest users of energy in Europe in the industrial space? Are they gonna shut their factories down? Are they gonna absorb the cost and destroy their margins and run at a loss? Like You're working through all of that analysis in your investing time. What's, what's unfortunate about that is you're not looking at the next biotech company that's gonna cure cancer. Right? It shifts your allocation of time as an investor away from what are the, the really salient growth stories that, that power global growth to playing defense, which is where are we going to get caught flat-footed by a crisis somewhere in the world? How much do you worry that some of the conflict that we're seeing, particularly the outbreak of the Israel-Hamas war, do you worry about it turning into a broader conflict in the Middle East? So what are the odds that the war between Israel and Hamas turns into a, a war that engulfs the entire Middle East? I believe the odds, I pray the odds, are small. I, none of us know, but we believe the odds are small. The trend in the Middle East has been towards peace. I mean, Saudi Arabia and Israel were about to reach a historic accord that only would strengthen peace in the Middle East. And there's some high probability that the actions by Hamas were influenced by this normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia that were likely to take place. So what's unfortunate is, is that peace in the Middle East holistically has been pushed further out in time. But I think across the regimes of the Middle East, they're not looking to escalate this into a larger dynamic of war between these, these countries of significance. Now, Israel does have a real problem. They're going to have to understand how to contain and control Hamas. They suffered an immeasurable loss of human life, the worst day for the Jewish population since the Holocaust. And Israel clearly has a right to defend itself. One of the things that frustrates me about Israel's current strategy is they will not clarify how they will deal with Gaza post these initial strikes, this initial movement of troops into the region. 
What does the world look like post the next three to six months? I think Israel really needs to give clarity on that issue to keep the Western world aligned in support of Israel. Speaking of the Western world, we were talking a lot about the U.S. fiscal situation and the fact here also that national defense spending is rising quite meaningfully, both in response to Ukraine and Israel. How do you pair the two things? So national defense spending is not rising nearly fast enough. And we, we know this by just looking at American stockpiles of weapons. I mean, one of the reasons that we, that we sent to the Ukraine cluster munitions is we're running out of munitions to send. There's quite a bit of backlash around the United States sending that type of, of military equipment to, to the front lines because of the risk to civilians. But the United States stockpiles are being depleted at an incredibly brisk rate. So what this speaks to is the need for us to rebuild our military industrial complex. If we're in a post-peace dividend world, we're going to have to put the investment, unfortunately, into national defense capabilities to protect American interests around the world. So that's a real pressure on the federal spending picture going forward that I don't really think the markets have yet fully incorporated. Like, we're still yearning for the reality of three years ago in a world that feels very much like Cold War II. So if you're thinking about this idea of a Cold War II, there's kind of a third player here, and we have to think about the presence of China and the relationship between China and the United States. Uh, one question I have for you is, if you were advising President Biden as he meets with China's President Xi, what would you say? Number one is we need to turn the mutual temperature down on the military touch points around Taiwan and in the greater China seas. Like, there is no room for an accident to take place. And, and both countries need to be very thoughtful around that reality. We don't want to give the people of either country that incident where two planes collide that create the outburst of nationalism that just continues to accelerate the degradation of, of the coupling between our two countries. I mean, the United States imports circa $500 billion of goods from China a year. Our economies are incredibly coupled together. And a, an abrupt decoupling would come at just catastrophic costs to the people of both countries. You know, if, if you look at some of the worst case scenarios, access, loss of access, for example, to the Taiwanese chip manufacturers, just wake up tomorrow and we can't buy chips from TSMC. How many weeks till every single production line of consequence in America shuts down? No Teslas, no Fords, no Boeing aircraft. Probably an 8 to 10% hit to GDP. So it's really important that we try to find common ground to build a better relationship with China on, rather than continuing this downward spiral of tit for tat on trade policies and otherwise. How do you think about this as uh, somebody who runs a business in terms of whether you- So no, so just take a step back. Mm -hmm. If I'm Biden, I don't show weakness. I don't project weakness in any way. I need to project a strong America. The Chinese respect a country that is comfortable in its own strength, just as the United States should respect China and its position on the world stage. I think one of the miscalculations by, by the Trump administration was to make the Chinese feel belittled or attacked. It, it was the wrong tone, the wrong rhetoric with one of our most important trading partners in the world. It sounds like, as you speak about the way global relationships are changing under the environment that we're in, you're calling for more of a normalization of relationships across the globe, let alone um, this idea that, that existed a couple of years ago where there was a call for more deglobalization. Do you think that the world is too interconnected to be delinked? No, I think the cost to the world of delinking is too high to even imagine. Like that's what's getting lost, is the cost of a delinked world is a world in which we're all profoundly poor. And we're poor at a moment in time where we almost everywhere in the Western world have aging societies 
large structural both deficits and debts, and we need to have economies that are growing and creating for the future if we're gonna meet the obligations to our retirees and if we're gonna offer a better future to our children. And in a world in which we're rapidly decoupling, there's no way we're gonna make our promises and commitments to our retirees and our children will actually, for the first time, have a bleaker future than we had and our parents had and our parents had. So how do you think about this back to as a business owner? Uh, there has been a sense that Citadel Securities has sought to expand in China in particular. What's the opportunity uh, in terms of the Chinese economy and what's the risk given the global tension? Well, let's take a huge step back. One of the areas in which the United States is extraordinarily good is financial services. And many of the world's top asset management businesses are right here in the United States from Fidelity to Blackstone to KKR to Citadel. The list goes on and on. Most of the preeminent asset management firms in the world are here in America. These firms create incredibly high paying jobs and throw off enormous sums of taxable income that helps to deal with the financial problems that we have as a, have as a government. I mean, think about the banking system. Name the most important banks in the world. The ones based in China or in the United States? The world would say it's the banks based in America. Like JP Morgan, you want to think about the dominant bank of the world, the first thing you're going to think about is JP Morgan. It's just that simple. And think about the incredible amount of both employment and taxable income that a JP Morgan throws off. Now, why do I talk about this in these ways? In Washington, there's a real pressure to attack Wall Street, to attack financial services. I don't understand why we want to injure a sector of our economy that is a world champion. Most countries try to protect their world champion industries. They try to encourage their growth and prosperity. So for me, I'm, I'm completely befuddled by the efforts of the progressive left to attack a part of our economy where we not only thrive domestically, but we thrive globally. Well, let's just get into it then. <laughs> let's talk about Gary Gensler. Um, it's no secret that you've been frustrated with his approach. He has a pretty sweeping agenda. You've said some pretty harsh things about his approach, but what frustrates you the most about what he is trying to accomplish? Well, there's a, there's a huge amount of effort to solve, to find solutions for problems that don't exist. Like that's, that's if I want to put it in a sentence, it's why are we finding solutions for problems that don't exist? Well, you know, what would the equity market look like? He's on a path to really change the way equity market structure works. If he succeeds with his current proposals, what would happen? So actually none of us know because his proposal has so many different moving parts, the intersection of which is, is not appreciated or understood. So we don't really know what that world looks like. I'll, I'll give you a simple sound bite. In the retail market, one of the most important concerns that retail investors have is how is their order handled? And in particular, there's an entire body of law that says a, a firm that manages the execution of a retail order cannot front run that order. And it's a, it's a very important law because it gives the retail investor confidence that they're being treated fairly. Now, here's what's remarkable. In one of Gary Gensler's market proposals, Every retail order must be sent to a publicly displayed auction. So not only can the market maker front run that order, but every single market maker can front run that order, legally. How in the world do you reconcile decades of regulatory decision making, all designed to protect retail investors, and undermine it in one fell swoop like this. So that's, that's a great example of a solution. In, in this case, it's an anti-solution in search of a problem. I'm glad you brought up the issue about the retail investor. You kind of made the joke about the, the meme stocks a little earlier. Gary Gensler is trying to protect the retail investor. Before I came uh, to interview you, I mentioned that I was interviewing you online, and about 600 responses came in about you and what you do. Why do you think that the American retail investor feels so much like Wall Street has an unfair advantage? What do you tell them? Well, I mean, first of all, that's, that's a 
there's two conversations here. There is, I'm a retail investor and I'm gonna compete with Wall Street. And the second is, when it comes down to the moment of execution, how am I treated, all right? So let's just start with basics. What's the day job of all of my investment team? It's to understand stocks, it's to understand companies, it's to meet with management teams. It's really hard as a retail investor who trades stocks in the free minutes of their day to compete with people whose entire life comes down to researching and understanding business models and the pricing of securities. It'd be like if we went on the street right now and found somebody to do this interview and to put them in the seat to moderate this interview. It's fair to say they'd struggle? <laughs> they had all the questions for you. So. <laughs> right? Like it's just it's just not a fair comparison. So so one of the challenges is I think the SEC, if you want to protect retail investors, it's get them into the right products. It's get them into mutual funds, it's to get them into index funds, it's to make sure that we encourage them to own portfolios of ETFs and diversified portfolios, to take advantage of the wealth management products that the large banks like JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley offer. Like that's a really powerful way to protect the interest of retail investors, is to encourage them to be in products that are professionally managed, that offer a, a much better risk return ratio than the average retail investor has in the market. Now having said that, having seen a substantial amount of order flow from the US retail investor over the years, there are of course some retail investors who are really good at, at understanding emerging trends. I mean look at how much money retail investors made in Tesla, and God bless. Like they were there at the start of this transformation of the, of the, of the automobile on the EV, EV wave that Elon Musk created, like they crushed it. Same with Apple. Same with a number of other really powerful stories. So clearly, we want to make sure retail has access to trading stocks directly, because for, for many of these investors, they're actually they're pretty good at it. But big picture, the SEC should encourage people to be in professionally managed products. For those that really do have a gift at understanding how the world's going to unfold, be comfortable in trading single stocks. Be comfortable in having portfolios that manifest your views. When we get down to the nuts and bolts of execution, let me tell you about the good old days when I was a retail investor in college. I paid $19.95 in commission and was lucky to have a 25 cent Y bid ask spread. In the early days of Citadel, in the good old days, we used to have spare phones. Do you know why? Traders would break them. <laughs> in frustration over their experience trading a stock on a given exchange. Well, we'll leave it at that, all right? We don't have any extra phones today. Sounds like an expensive habit. It was an expensive habit. <laughs> but there were a lot of expensive days. You'd go to buy 100,000 shares, you'd buy 10,000, the price is up a quarter of a point. You buy 10,000 more, the price is up a quarter of a point. Not a quarter of a cent, a quarter of a point. That was the good old days in the 1990s trading stocks in the United States. Today, retail investors trade for zero commission and a spread that's a fraction of the posted spread on the marketplace. So a stock that's a penny wide, retail trades for eight tenths of a cent or seven tenths of a cent. It's a remarkably efficient market. It's a real testament to the power of technology, to the power of, of the ability to process millions of transactions a day at costs that are next to zero within our financial infrastructure. Well, let's talk about uh, efficiency for a second here. What does this mean for the equity markets relative to other less efficient markets? Citadel has been expanding into many new areas, both Citadel and Citadel Securities. It's captured the attention of a lot of Wall Street, the move into fixed income in a much bigger way. Are you looking to places outside of the equity market in a much bigger way? And are you concerned about the ability to capture more alpha in the equity markets these days? Well, there's a, there's a lot in that question. So let's, let's unpack that in a couple different ways. Equity market in the United States, holistically, extraordinarily efficient. And that's great. That means our market is allocating capital to the best and highest use. That's how we create jobs. That's how we create a stronger America. Fixed income markets in the United States, Treasury market, unfortunately, is getting too big. We need to get our fiscal house in order. We've talked about that. Corporate bond market, under quite a bit of change. The rise of, of private lending is, is really starting to, to show an impact on the overall corporate bond market. 
And I do worry about that. I worry about the lack of price transparency. I worry about the lack of real-time feedback loops that indicate to both managers and investors how good or how well is my capital being allocated. So one of my worries about the rise of private credit is we're undermining the transparency of price that's so important for all of us to understand how good of a job are we doing at allocating risk. Now, in, in trading markets, in capital markets, in civil securities, I mean, to be clear, what we've done is we've been at the forefront of the electronification of markets. We felt that the good old days where you broke phones were days that would be left in the past by the rise of technology. And we went all in on that bet. And we were right. Like, we got that one right. The rise of electronic trading in options, in equities, in fixed income has really dramatically changed or transformed the end user's experience in trading these products. Even if you're trading by voice, because the trade you're doing is bigger than the trade that's typical in the electronic market, you're leveraging the price transparency and you're leveraging liquidity that takes place in those electronic markets. So that, that's been a transformation that we have been a huge beneficiary of as Citadel Securities. We've pushed this transformation and it's been, it's been a sea change for end investors around the world. Bid ask spreads have plummeted holistically. Liquidity has soared across virtually every product type that's moved to electronic markets. And price formation is far more clear and transparent. Now, what does this mean in the context of new technologies? AI, gener generative AI in particular, does it add something to the table that existing technologies don't already do? So I, I think the impact on financial markets will be less than it will be in other parts of the economy. And I think you know, one thing to keep in mind with generative AI is it, it does produce written words, it produces images, it, pushes, it produces things that we as humans can immediately relate to. In, in fact, it's, it's almost like magic, right? Like write a speech on X and you'll write back a pretty, a pretty good speech. Write a paper on Y. I mean, it's remarkable how it's able to create free-form text that seems logical and coherent. Accurate, well, that's another question sometimes. But it's really transformational as compared to predecessor forms of machine learning, which produced zeros and ones, much more inscrutable. Now, machine learning has been used by the market maker community for years. It's part of how we've been able to bring down bid-ask spreads and increase liquidity is through machine learning, we can better understand how to price risk and how to manage risk, and those techniques are widely used across Wall Street today. From my perspective, the, the big impact of generative AI is gonna be call centers, translation work, producing content for Hollywood. I mean, the ability to render, I, I've told this story before, I, a friend of mine showed me an image of a future Star Trek clip or movie, which is yet to be created. And there's James Kirk. And there is Dr. Mr. Spock. And they look perfect, except they don't exist. <laughs> so over at the hedge fund at Citadel, how do you think about either getting in on the AI craze, or do you think that it's in too much of a bubble? Well, I mean, OK, so the minute you say get in on the AI craze, you've given the answer. Like we're not, we're not trying to get in on crazes. We're trying to get into businesses where, where the market has yet to perceive the value or impact. That's, that's where we wanna put our capital. We wanna put our capital on what's going to be important in the future. Now, there are dimensions of the AI craze that we think are really interesting. For example, how Microsoft is using AI to empower its suite of software and how Microsoft is driving its users towards the cloud is a really interesting study in corporate strategy. I mean, I gotta tell you, they're just crushing it. And by creating a product suite that pushes you towards their cloud environment, they really marry you to Microsoft holistically in a very different way than you've been married to Microsoft in the last 10 or 15 years. So we think about these second order effects that these technologies have. We think about how um, you know, first order effect of Ozempic is people lose a bunch of weight. Second order effect is they drink less alcohol. 
So you want to make sure you don't own as much of the, of the alcohol-oriented companies around the world. It's the second order effects we spend a lot of time at thinking in our, in our investment management. I, we all know what's happening first order. What's going to happen second order? How do we capitalize on that? Another question quickly on the future of Citadel Securities. You, about a year and a half ago, maybe a little more than that now, took an investment from Paradigm and Sequoia. What does that mean in terms of the direction of travel? Uh, what have you learned from them in terms of technology? And does this signal an IPO anytime soon? Well, so I think we need to ask Gary Gensler, do we want public companies in America? <laughs> That's a bit of a, a question mark these days. In fact, there's, there's roughly 1,200 plus unicorns companies valued at over a billion dollars that are not public. What is it that we have done to destroy the value proposition of being public in America? And by the way, that's 1,200 companies that would have written tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of retirement stories. Right? Think about all the people that we've met in our lives that have a story of, do you know, my grandmother bought IBM when it first went public and she owned it till the day she died and she died with $10 million, right? We, we all know these stories of people who have been able to take advantage of the enormous wealth creation of American entrepreneurs, and these companies staying private for longer is depriving American retail investors of that opportunity. So that's number one. Number two, Sequoia has been a fantastic partner in the business. They are, they are absolutely great in the boardroom. They keep my management team focused on the right issues, the right metrics, they really help to be a voice of, of both passion around growth and passion around running a business. And of course, they do have the expertise as to what it takes to run a successful public company, and they bring that to the table each and every day. So they've been a great partner to work with. I, I really value the relationship that we have with Sequoia. Does this all signal an intent for you, particularly at the hedge fund firm, to be investing more in the private markets? So there's no doubt that market forces today are pushing one to think more and more about investing in private markets. There's no doubt. As the SEC continues to pursue strategies that shrink the relative size of the public markets, you need to think about what's your growth equity strategy, what's your private credit strategy, what's your private, e private equity strategy. Like This is where the SEC is ironically pushing the business is away from public markets. And that unfortunately pushes more and more capital appreciation opportunities outside of the hands of American retail investors. So before I let you go, we have about 10 minutes left here. We talked about the future of Citadel. We've talked about the future of the economy. What do you think is a bigger issue? We are so close to the US election. And frankly, there's no stage you've been on <laughs> that anyone gets away with not asking you what you think the future of the country is. What do you think is a bigger issue going into the election next year, the economy or national security at this point? People are going to vote their pocketbook. How are you voting with your pocketbook? Uh, my pocketbook's doing okay these days, <laughs> so I'm going to vote the, the national security issue. Well, to that, to that, to that event, too, you've <laughs> spoken quite favor favorably of Nikki Haley, uh, partially because of her expertise in this, in this arena. Do you think she has a chance to beat Donald Trump in the primaries? And if not, what do you think is her biggest challenge? Look, we're going to find out over the next 12 weeks if she has that chance or not. The issue is going to come down to, is he brave enough to face her in a debate? Are you supporting her financially yet? That's a decision that we're actively contemplating. I mean, we're at the finish line on that choice, yes or no. But I think the real issue is, is Donald Trump, for all of his bluster, willing to get on stage with Nikki Haley or not? I mean, Joe Biden at least had the excuse of COVID. What's Trump's excuse? So you would like to see her face off against him more significantly? 100%. 100%. I'd like to see him show us What's he made of at this moment in time? So, and, and by the way, I think the American public deserves to see. The American public needs to see, can Donald Trump hold his own with Nikki Haley? If he can, that's actually pretty important. Because if it ends up being Trump versus Biden, we're, both gonna be, we're all going to be asking ourselves about their relative mental capacity. What do you think the chances are that she could beat him? It sounds like you're pretty in her corner. I, liked, I mean, I'd like to see the battle. I'd like to see that. So you've also mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of curious. And by the way, I'd like to see a battle of ideas rather than a battle of name calling. You can't run the largest economy in the world as a name calling bully. You can run the largest economy in the world with the right policies. And what we're facing right now in our country is since 
President Biden became president, the consumer faces prices that are almost 20% higher. They've had no wage growth to speak of in real terms, none. And our deficits increased, our national debts increased by 15% of GDP. The American public knows things aren't working in this economy for them. And they actually ask, well, who's it working for? They had this misplaced idea it works for Wall Street. It's working for no one. This is the price of bad economic policies. I mean, whoever told them to run on Bidenomics has no idea how to read an economics textbook. So the question here in looking forward is, where's Biden, Biden going to go on his economic policies? And are we going to see policies that are going to create real wage growth, that are going to control inflation, that are going to give us a brighter future that we deserve as an American people? And then for Donald Trump, is he willing to get on stage with Dickie Haley and talk about these policies, whether it's national defense or economics? Because this is what the American voters should care about. And nine months ago, a year ago, you might have argued that the American voter could look at this election as being a bit of an entertainment moment. It doesn't really matter who president is, things are okay, but they're not. We're, we're, there's two wars in this world. There's an out of control problem with spending in Washington. We've got to put our house in order, national security, our budget, to have a brighter future for America. Now, you've mentioned in a recent interview with David Rubenstein that you would prefer more younger candidates coming into office, uh, both on the Republican and Democratic side, frankly. Is there anyone you would support as an up-and-comer? So it doesn't matter like who I would support, it's who's running today. That's, I mean, one of the challenges with being involved in politics is you have to accept the reality of what the playing field is. Now, with Nikki Haley, we do have somebody who's younger. We've got somebody who has the foreign policy experience to be helpful. That's a real plus. But in both parties, we just, we need to, we need to encourage people who are younger to step into the fray. And on the Democratic side, let's be clear, in fairness to their younger up and coming uh, party members, it's hard to run against the incumbent president. You're not likely to win, and you're likely to hurt that person's odds in a general election. So that makes people hesitant to insert themselves into a race against Biden. I've got to ask, you know, also in that same interview, you had mentioned that you had political ambitions in the distant past, maybe for governor or a lawmaker one day, and you've pushed back on the idea of running for president yourself. What are the circumstances in the nation and personally that you would accept a call to serve as the Treasury Secretary? All right, well, let's, let's just give a little context here. David and I uh, are both huge collectors of American documents or, or documents of our government, right? I, have a, I own a copy of the US Constitution. He has a great copy of the Declaration of Independence. The context was I, I really have great interest in public policy and in good governance. I, I, all of us in this room are committed and want to have good governance in America. And having studied government at Harvard, like, there's no doubt there's moments in my life I've thought about what it would be like to be in public office. Like, that's just... As part of being in government at Harvard is you have that fantasy, all right? I have no fantasy in being a treasurer. I've got a, I've got a great day job. I've got 4,000 colleagues I work for. If, if there were a financial crisis, of course I would serve our country in a heartbeat, of course. But right here, right now, I don't think that being Secretary of Treasury would create the opportunity to change our country for the better in a way that would be profound enough for me to walk away from my lifetime work in building Citadel and my three kids who are all basically teenagers right now. Very last question for you. You uh, have been building out your presence right here in Miami. Uh, you have a big presence in New York. You have reduced your exposure to Chicago. Miami or New York, you know, what is kind of the, the vote for both sides here? What, what is in favor of either city? Well, so that's a, that's a great question. And let's cut to the chase. New York is the financial capital of America today. And it's New York's to lose. The density of talent, both in financial services and just writ large in New York City, is amongst the top in the world. I mean, New York really is an epicenter of thoughtful people passionately engaged in their careers. It's a, it's a very unique and powerful city both in the United States and around the world. It's also the cultural center of the United States. It's a, whether it's Broadway or otherwise the arts, New York, is, New York has just so much to offer. 
Now, having said that, Miami, I think, represents the future of America. Incredibly vibrant economy. You will have people on stage today that are part of the government here in Florida. You won't be able to tell if they're Republican or Democrats. You would not be able to tell. They're focused on civil society, they're focused on the business community, and they're focused on good governance. This is a state that has done an incredible job of electing people into office who care about safe streets, good schools, and good jobs. And it's really great to be in a state where those are the focuses of your leaders. And I say that as somebody that, that was committed to Chicago for 30 years, who saw my city devolve into anarchy under poor governance. And I really do believe there are very important lessons for America from the good governance that you see here in the state of Florida, particularly at the state and county level. I just, it's really, it's just such a delight to be here. Next time we'll be debating this one for, for years to come. We, we will, and we'll see how big Wall Street South becomes. Um, we're on Brickle, Brickle Bay right here, and maybe in 50 years it'll be um, Brickle Bay North, was how we'll refer to New York in finance.